It's been a few weeks now since the first reports began to appear of M1 Mac users experiencing excessive SSD wear. This is something that concerns many M1 Mac users and rightly so. In my previous video I performed some tests running the same applications on an Intel Mac and an M1 Mac with the same amount of RAM side by side. What I found was that on average the M1 Mac was writing about 20 times more data to the SSD than the Intel Mac while doing the same work. This means that if you're currently using an Intel Mac and you're seeing about 50 gigabytes a day written to the SSD, by switching to an M1 Mac, you'd be seeing a terabyte of data written each day under the same workload. In this video, I'm gonna be going into a more in-depth examination of this issue, explaining more about how SSD wear works, making some informed projections as to how long you might expect your SSD to last, and what you might do to mitigate or even avoid the issue. To understand why having such large amounts of data written to the SSD is bad, it's necessary to understand the basics of how SSDs work. An SSD stores its data in NAND cells. Every SSD has billions of these cells, each of which stores between 1 bit and 4 bits of data, depending on the technology used. Every cell is a floating gate transistor, which contains a control gate and a floating gate isolated by an oxide layer. Whenever a cell is written or erased, electrons move through the oxide layer between the substrate layer and the floating gate. Over time, this causes the oxide layer to slowly degrade, and eventually it degrades to the point where it can no longer reliably store data. The more data that's written to these cells, the quicker they will degrade. SSD controllers use a technique called wear leveling to distribute writes as evenly as possible across all of the cells in the SSD. With that established, it becomes clear why the M1 Max writing such large amounts of data to the SSD is a problem. The question most people want answered is how long will the SSD last? Let's start with a description of the terms used by drive manufacturers to describe SSD endurance. The warrantable endurance of consumer SSDs is given in TBW, which stands for terabytes written. This is the total amount that can be written to a drive over its lifetime. Samsung's 250GB 970 EVO, for example, is rated for 150TBW meaning that Samsung guaranteed that at least 150 terabytes can be written to the drive before it will begin to fail. That doesn't mean it will fail as soon as 150 terabytes have been written. It may well last to 200 or even 300 terabytes. However, as the amount of data written increases past the rate of endurance, the likelihood of SSD failure and data loss increases exponentially. Endurance can vary greatly between drives. The CS3030 NVMe SSD from PNY, for example, has a TBW rating of 380 terabytes for the 250 gigabyte drive, which is more than double the endurance of the Samsung drive of the same capacity. Another term you might come across, especially with enterprise class SSDs, is DWPD. This stands for drive writes per day. And it's the number of times the entire drive capacity can be written each day over a specified period of time. Samsung's PM1725B Enterprise Class SSD, for example, has a DWPD of 3 and a warranty period of 5 years. That means that you could overwrite the entire drive 3 times every day for 5 years and still be covered under warranty. So, what's the endurance of Apple's SSD? This is the big question that nobody can answer with certainty. Apple doesn't provide a figure for the endurance of the SSDs in their Macs. The best we can do is come up with an educated estimate based on the information we have available. A look at the IO registry shows that Apple obfuscates the actual SSD manufacturer, assigning the SSD their own Apple APO256Q name. However, if we dig a little further into controller characteristics, we find that the chips are 3D TLC NAND, storing 3 bits per cell, and that they're manufactured by SK Hynix.
Assuming that Apple used Hynix's most recent NAND chips, they may well be the same 128 layer 3D TLC NAND that Hynix used in their Gold P31 NVMe SSD that was released in August of last year, about three months before the release of the first M1 Max. The Gold P31 has an endurance rating of 0.5 drive rates per day over a five year period. If we make a calculation based on these values, this would give the 256GB drive in my M1 MacBook Air a TBW rating of 233TB, which is 0.5 times 256GB times 365 days times 5 years. So based on this, let's look at three possible scenarios. First, let's say that my M1's SSD actually does have a TBW rating of 233. The same as Hynix's Gold P31 SSD. In my case, I've written on average about 682GB a day over the last two weeks. If we divide 233TB by the amount written each day, we can see that at this rate I'd hit that 233TB threshold in 341 days, or 11 months and 6 days. This doesn't mean that the drive is then guaranteed to fail, but it does mean that drive failure is much more likely and that the resale value plummets. For the second scenario, let's make a calculation based on the first M1 Mac reported to have died due to the SSD being worn out. It was a 4 month old M1 MacBook Pro with 16GB of RAM and a 512GB SSD. It had had 512TB written to the SSD over the 4 months of its life. So if that's typical it would put the TBW rating for the 512GB model M1 Max at 512TB and proportionally the 256GB drive in my MacBook Air would have a TBW rating of 256. In this scenario I could expect to hit the TBW threshold slightly later in about 1 year and 10 days. For the third scenario, let's imagine that the NAND Apple have used are high endurance ones like those used in Seagate's Iron Wolf 510 SSD. These drives are specifically engineered for high endurance and their 240 gigabyte drive has an endurance of 435 TBW. If we make a calculation based on the SSD in my M1 MacBook Air having the same endurance as Seagate's Iron Wolf 510, then I would hit the TBW threshold in about 637 days, or 1 year and 9 months. The important thing to stress here is that we don't know which, if any of these scenarios, is correct, because we don't know what the actual endurance rating of Apple's SSD really is, since they don't share that information. There's another very important difference to note about the M1 Max as compared to the Intel Max. Even though my 12 inch MacBook also has a soldered SSD that can't be replaced, when that SSD dies I can still connect an external SSD to the USB port and continue using the laptop. The M1 MacBook won't boot from an external drive once the internal SSD dies, it will simply stop working. The internal SSD contains several vital containers, including the iBoot system container and one true recovery that are required for the computer to work, and these containers can only exist on the internal drive. Even if you're booting your M1 Mac from an external drive now, it's still reading the boot firmware from the internal SSD. Since this issue appeared a few weeks ago, there have been a lot of theories put forward and most of them are clearly incorrect. So in this part of the video, I'm going to go through some of them and explain why they're wrong. This isn't an issue with the M1 Max, but an issue with Big Sur and it affects Intel Max too. This is provably unequivocally an issue that affects the M1 Max and only the M1 Max. Intel Max with the same amount of RAM, running the same applications with the same workload on the same version of macOS don't exhibit this behaviour. Windows and Linux use Swap 2, so the M1 Macs are no different. The issue isn't that the M1 Macs use Swap, all modern operating systems use Swap. The issue is the quantity of data that's being written to the SSD, 
and on the M1 Max the amount of data is much, much higher than on other operating systems, and several times higher than Intel Macs running the same software. This is a bug in specific apps. All the applications I tried have exhibited similar behaviour, that is several times more data being written to the SSD when using an M1 Mac, when compared to an Intel Mac with the same amount of RAM running the same software. People are expecting too much from the M1 MacBook Air. It's only supposed to be used for basic tasks like word processing and web browsing, not for video and photo editing, more commonly known as the you're using it wrong argument. Here's how Apple describes the M1 MacBook Air on their website. MacBook Air can take on new, extraordinarily intensive tasks like professional quality editing. If you look at the benchmarks they choose to demonstrate the MacBook Air's capabilities, they show Final Cut Pro, Xcode, Logic Pro and Lightroom, all professional applications. It's very clear that Apple expect and intend the M1 MacBook Air to be used by professionals for intensive workloads. Secondly, I've edited 4K video on a 2014 MacBook Air with a dual core i7 and 4GB of RAM. I've edited 4K video on a 2015 MacBook Pro with 8GB of RAM, on a 2016 12-inch MacBook with 8GB, on an iPad mini with 3GB of RAM, and on a $200 Android phone. The idea that somehow editing video and photos on those devices is just fine, but doing the same thing on the vastly more powerful M1 MacBook Air is kind of just asking for it to break, is nonsensical. The only thing that should concern you when deciding between 8GB and 16GB of RAM is performance. While it's reasonable to expect lower performance if you go with 8GB, what isn't reasonable is the possibility of the laptop dying because you did so. It's caused by Rosetta 2. Although in my tests the Intel version of Lightroom running under Rosetta 2 showed the largest amount of data being written, running native ARM64 software on the M1 Mac still wrote between 8 times and 32 times more data than the Intel versions running on an Intel Mac. It's a bug in the smart monitoring tools that aren't reporting the data correctly. It's very clear that the power on hours and the power cycle information reported by smart reporting software is incorrect. However, the most important numbers, that is the amount written, can be correlated very easily across IOSTAT, Activity Monitor, Smart On Tools, Drive DX and Disk Drill. They all match, which strongly implies that the value reported is correct. It's not a problem because SSDs often exceed their rated durability anyway. It's true that SSDs often carry on working well past their manufacturer's stated endurance threshold, but given the massive amounts of data being written, 20 times more on average, even if the SSD and the M1 Max last twice as long as their rated capacity, they're still going to die 10 times faster than those in the Intel Max under the same workload. You can prevent it by not running apps that cause lots of data to be written. Well, yes you could, I could just stop using Chrome, Safari, Final Cut Pro, Apple Photos, Photoshop and Lightroom. But since the entire purpose of having a computer is to run software, not running software isn't much of a solution. It's like saying you can fix a broken car by not driving it anymore. This is just sensationalism by the tech media, and it's blown out of all proportion. If anything, it's the exact opposite. In most of the articles I've read, they've done their very best to play down the issue and reassure users that it's something you don't need to worry about. One very common factor that I've noticed in almost every article is that they vastly underestimate the amount of data being written. Likely because they're still thinking of average usage in terms of the Intel Max rather than the M1 Max. On ZDNet, for example, in their article on this issue, they say that you'd have to be writing 100 gigabytes onto the drive every single day to exceed the TBW rating in a year. As if that was some kind of crazy, ridiculous figure that nobody would ever realistically reach. In fact, my M1 Mac almost hits that 100GB in 10 minutes by just editing 3 photos in Lightroom.
In Mac World's article about this issue, they say that someone would have to be writing 7.5 terabytes a month to exceed the rated capacity in less than two years. My M1 Max SSD has had 7.5 terabytes written in the last five days. Other parts will probably break before the drive wears out. That was certainly the case with most other Macs prior to the M1. If you had an iBook G3 or a 2011 MacBook Pro, for example, you'd most likely see your GPU die prematurely. If you had a 2016 or 2017 MacBook Pro, you'd be more likely to see the display flex cable stop working. The longevity of every model of Mac is defined by its weakest component. And it appears, at the moment at least, that with the M1 Max, that component is the SSD. So what is the explanation? I think that there are a few possibilities at the moment. First, there's a bug in macOS Big Sur specific to the M1 Max that's causing excessive amounts of data to be written needlessly to the internal SSD and which Apple will inevitably fix at some point. Second, the M1 Max are functioning as intended. The high SSD usage is simply a feature of the M1's design and there's nothing that can be done. Or third, IOSTAT, Activity Monitor and all of the various smart monitoring programs are just reporting the wrong values and there's really no problem. Any of these options is possible but I think the first option is the most likely followed by the second. So what can be done to mitigate it? If you're using your Mac to edit photos or video, make sure that you're editing from an external drive. Leave as much free space on your internal drive as possible. Only the operating system and your applications should be on the internal drive. Data files like documents, photos and videos should be on an external drive. This not only means that you won't lose your data in the event your SSD does die, but the more free space that's available, the better where leveling can do its job of extending the SSD's life. Get AppleCare so that Apple will repair the Mac for three years instead of just one. Keep an Intel Mac around as a backup so that you can continue working while your M1 Mac is being repaired. And the most extreme option, but also the safest, install macOS on an external SSD and unmount the internal drive at startup. It's inconvenient and adds extra expense, but it ensures that nothing is being written to your internal drive. As for me, I'm going to be buying AppleCare and I'll continue to use my M1 Mac for as long as it lasts. The same way I've used all of the other 19 Mac laptops I owned before it. I'm going to code, I'm going to edit video and I'm going to edit photos because I should absolutely be able to. And if or when it stops working, I fully expect that Apple will fix it.